Well, hello there. Welcome back to Paleocrat Diaries on the Meaning of Catholic. I'm your host for the Ecumenical Councils. I'm Jake Fowler, and welcome once more. This is part five. Finally reached the Council of Ephesus. I had spoken previously, two videos ago, in part four, about a little bit of how we got here. So today, we'll look at the council itself, and then my plan, if we have time, is the aftermath. What happened? What went right? What went wrong? And then, as always, a little cliffhanger before we come to Chalcedon, which was only 20 years after the fact. So between now, we're, we're in about 431, right? 430, 431, somewhere in there. Between now and 451, Chalcedon, there's a lot. There's a lot to say. All right. Music. Shh. Okay. Outline. Check. Martini. Check. The Council of Ephesus, 431. I realized after the fact, last time, that I had failed to mention perhaps the single most uh, important, or maybe the spark, that's how I should say it, the spark that set this whole thing off. Remember, Nestorius is the patriarch of Constantinople at this time. In the year 428, he comes from Antioch, so he's bringing with him an entourage of Antiochian theologians, and these priests are preaching uh, according to the way they've been trained. Remember, this is analysis over synthesis. And one of the priests, um, whose, whose name I don't have at this time, he's preaching against Mary as the mother of God. He's preaching against Mary as Theotokos. And this starts problems in Constantinople because the laity have understood the, the opposite. They've understood Mary to be the mother of God. This is the language of prayer. This has been what they had received. And although the clergy could offer fairly high-minded reasons for saying what they were saying, the faithful rejected it. Well, Nestorius, he supported his priests. These were his friends from, from Antioch. And so he kind of doubles down. And every chance he got... He spoke against Theotokos. He preached against it, I should say. Even to the point where he was going out of his way to do so. Well, it, it, it became such a problem that even laity were, for example, standing up in the middle of the cathedral and shouting at him that he was in error. Now, I'm not advocating for that, right? It might... That's a temptation we face these days, right, for obvious reasons. I'm not advocating for that. But that's what happened to Nestorius. There was a man, uh, he was a lawyer, very intelligent, whose name was Eusebius. And he was the one who publicly, very publicly, very loudly interrupted and told Nestorius exactly what he thought of him. So I, I had neglected to mention that in part four. I wanted to address that briefly before we look at the council itself. The refusal to treat of Mary as Theotokos started this whole thing. And so why was the Christology off base? Or, or what led the awareness that the Christology was off base? Was this initial reluctance to call Mary the mother of God. Well, why do you want to not call her the mother of God? What's the problem with that? Well, if Christ and the man Jesus are not exactly the same, then we wouldn't be able to say that the mother of Jesus is the mother of God. So there's the connection. That's what the laity sensed, right? The census fidelium kicked in. That's what Cyril and Celestine, the Pope at the time, they recognized this as well that this was a problem. Remember, Celestine, in August of 430, had had a Roman synod wherein Nestorius and his position were condemned, and he was ordered to recant. He had 10 days. 
from receipt of Celestine's decision, that is. Okay, I'm going back too far. You can go watch part four if you want that information. So here we are. We're in 431. We're in June. The council is set to meet. The battle lines were drawn, right? The emperor had sent out invitations, Theodosius II. He had sent out invitations to all the bishops of the world, and he instructed them that the patriarchs could each bring about 12 guys, right? So gather some advisors, gather some theologians, show up to Ephesus in June, and we'll have a council. Cyril, St. Cyril of Alexandria, the patriarch, he brought with him 50 bishops from Egypt and fanatical monks led by a certain one named Shinudi, who was extremely devoted to Cyril. Memnon of Ephesus was also aligned with Cyril's position, and he showed up with 62 bishops. Juvenal of Jerusalem, the patriarch there, arrived with 15 Palestinian bishops. So let's see, some quick math, uh, 112, 127, 28, 29, 30. 130 bishops at least on the side of St. Cyril. And if they were following Theodosius's instructions, there would have been 36. Nestorius, on the other hand, he shows up with 16 bishops. So, okay, he's, he's doing more of what the emperor had in mind. But he brought a large armed bodyguard. In other words, he brought some soldiers. This was in early June. On June 6th, the patriarch of Antioch, whose name was John, he sends word that he's still going to be another five or six days. And Cyril accepts this. Cyril, by the way, I don't recall if I mentioned this last time. Cyril had been given presidency of the council by Celestine. He was deputed to go and take care of business. So Cyril says, okay, five or six days, John, no problem. But by the 22nd of June, John was not there. He had still not arrived. And on top of that, his messengers, John's messengers to Cyril, were giving conflicting information as to why. Were the messengers confused? Was John playing games? Chances are he would have been more aligned with Nestorius, given that they were both Antiochian theologians. Cyril smelled a rat. He was suspecting a boycott. And so, armed with the Pope's mandate, he opens the council on June 22nd against the protests of the imperial representatives, I should add. So, June 22nd, here we go, Council of Ephesus. The council did its work in just one day, less than 24 hours. You have to imagine, they woke up, they had their breakfast, they chit-chatted a little bit, they spent some time by the water cooler, then they thought, you know, should we gather the council? John's still not here. Yeah, I'm going to do it. No, don't do it. Yeah, I think I'm going to do it. So this is not just a day like, wow, they crammed it into a whole day. When the sources tell us they did the council in a day, I'm imagining something like eight to ten hours. I'm willing to be corrected on that. But this doesn't seem to me to mean that they got up very early at dawn and they worked late into the night and they really gave it all they had. That's not the impression that I'm getting from the sources. Nonetheless, so June 22nd, 431. No attention is paid to Pope Celestine's condemnation of Nestorius. Instead, Cyril proceeds by explaining his own position, reading his letter that he sent to Nestorius. There were three, actually. He reads his second one, which was arguably the most important. And then Nestorius's letter to Cyril is read. Remember the Antioch-Alexandria rivalry? Nestorius would have been mm, not pleased to be a part of these proceedings. Nestorius would have remembered 
what happened to John Chrysostom. He was Antiochene. He was the Patriarch of Constantinople. He was wrongfully charged and deposed by Cyril's uncle, the, uh, I forget his name. It might have been, oh, Theophilus. That's it. Theophilus of Alexandria, Cyril's uncle, who was Patriarch of Alexandria at the time. Nestorius is thinking of all these things. And so they're holding these proceedings against him with Cyril's letter being read and his own letter being read. And he says, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm not, gonna, I'm not participating. The Patriarch of Jerusalem, Juvenal, he proposes in the council's session that the faith of Nicaea be proclaimed anew. Cyril's 12 anathemas that I had mentioned previously were not discussed, but somehow came to be included in the Acts of the Council. Various patristic texts were also taken up, and Nestorius' writings were included in the Acts as well. In the end, after several hours, somewhat less than 24, Nestorius was deposed by 197 bishops. So I mentioned Cyril had 130 firmly on his side. Nestorius had 16 and some soldiers, or at least some guys with weapons. Where are the other 67 bishops from? I'm not sure. Maybe these were the swing votes, as it were. Whatever the case is, they agreed with Cyril and Celestine against Nestorius. And so they wrote to him. This is sort of a, I mean, not sort of, this is very scathing, at least in, in my opinion. I was reading this and I thought, wow, I can't believe they said that. Here's what they said. Remember, Nestorius is not there. To Nestorius, new Judas, know that by reason of your impious preachings and of your disobedience to the canons, on the 22nd of this month of June, you have been deposed by the Holy Synod, and you no longer have any rank in the church. Imagine being Nestorius, receiving that, right? You've, you've seen the writing on the wall. You know how many guys Cyril brought with him. You know how many guys you brought. And you know what happened to John, John Chrysostom. Cyril is your accuser. Cyril is your judge. This is not going to go well. So he was boycotting. He didn't show up. I'm, I'm sure the other 16 bishops went on his behalf. So they bring him this letter, this deposition, and he's reading it. New Judas, you have betrayed Christ. No longer any rank in the church. What that must have felt like at that moment. My, my blood, if I were Nestorius, my blood would have been boiling. In the evening, when the work of the council was done, and the laity who were gathered outside the church, from what I understand, anxiously awaiting the decision. Because remember, they were extremely amped up about this. The laity of Ephesus held a huge impromptu party. They led the bishops through the streets. There was a torch-lit procession. They're taking them back to their lodges, singing Marian hymns, praying, rejoicing. The Theotokos had crushed heresy. All is well. Or is it? John of Antioch, who surely had heard news of what happened. He and his party arrived four days later on June 26th, and he brought with him uh, 40 or so bishops from the Orient, the eastern portion of the church. They immediately convoked another council. This second one deposed and excommunicated Cyril and Memnon, the bishop of Ephesus. They nullified the acts of the council on the 22nd, and they produced a creed written by John of Antioch, the patriarch. So now we have 
rival councils in Ephesus within days of each other, the one conducted by Cyril under Celestine's permission, the other conducted by another patriarch, John, without Celestine's permission, Cyril condemns and deposes Nestorius, John condemns and deposes Cyril. Hmm. Who to believe? Who's right? Bishop against bishop. And I should add, at this time, there's no reason to suspect that John of Antioch is a heretic. For all we know, he was considered perfectly orthodox. Confusion reigns in Ephesus. The imperial representative, Count Candidian, he's not quite sure what to do, so he errs on the side of caution, and he declares both councils null and void, and he writes to Theodosius II, the emperor, for further instructions. On the 29th of June, three days later, instructions came. The bishops are to remain in Ephesus, the emperor said, until the affair has been sorted out. Cyril's council was annulled. Can an emperor do that? He called it in the first place. Celestine agreed. Theodosius obviously thinks he can, or else why would he have? In July, so a few days later, The papal legates finally arrived. There were three of them, two Italian bishops and one priest. And their instructions were to act as judges, not to engage in debate, and in all things doubtful, in any doubtful matter, defer to Cyril. So they convoke a second session of Cyril's council. It's obvious that the papal legates and Cyril and Memnon and Juvenal of Jerusalem disregarded the emperor's annulment of the first session, which occurred on June 22nd. So in a second and then a third session of Cyril's Council of Ephesus, the council fathers, along with the legates, approved the acts of the first session and declared the proceeding to be ecumenical, since the West was now in agreement. Now the representatives have arrived, they have agreed, Cyril got it right, he's done everything Celestine said, this is scriptural, this is apostolic, we're good. In August, however, another imperial official arrives. You see, the controversy wasn't settled. John of Antioch was holding out. Nestoria certainly was holding out. So there's another count. His name is John. He's the minister of finance, and Theodosius thinks he's the man for the job. Theodosius sent Count John with some letters for all the people involved with the council. Sure, Theodosius, he's really keeping up with what's going on. He sent a letter to Pope Celestine, to Rufinus of Thessalonica, and Augustine of Hippo. But Celestine was in Rome, Rufinus was in Thessalonica, and Augustine was dead. Theodosius obviously is confused about the whole thing. He doesn't even know who's there and who's not there. So is it his advisors, his ministers, his representatives aren't being very clear? Maybe Theodosius is under one impression of what's going on and he's just not getting good news reports? Maybe he himself wasn't very bright? I don't know. Whatever the case, he's obviously, it's, it was a misstep. Count John ordered, and he says this is from the emperor, that Cyril, Memnon, and Nestorius were to be detained, and that no bishops were allowed to leave the city until the matter was settled. Now, I should mention at this point, there's a certain count whom Nestorius is quite close with. 
His man, uh, this man's name is Irenaeus. Irenaeus is a fairly important official, and having his ear, Nestorius starts to try to pull strings with the emperor. Cyril found out about this, so he starts to do the same. But he turns his attention to Count John, the most recent representative to have arrived, the Minister of Finance. He starts showering John with all sorts of gifts. And suddenly, this is very shocking, suddenly, just out of nowhere, unexplainable, John starts to favor Cyril. Hmm, interesting. There are some reconciliation talks that are being held with Theodosius himself. In these talks, Cyril and his party prevailed. Nestorius, whom I believe took part in these discussions, says, probably tongue-in-cheek, that he would resign if only orthodoxy would be upheld. Well, he didn't mean Cyrillian orthodoxy. He meant his own orthodoxy, or at least what he believed to be orthodoxy. Obviously, he was mistaken. But he says, I'll resign. I just want the truth to prevail. Well, the emperor took him at his word and said, back to Antioch then. See ya. So not only is Nestorius deposed as new Judas, betrayer of Christ, but when he tries to kind of subtly humble himself in order to gain the upper hand and appear to be so reasonable, he's taken at his word, sent back to Antioch. Oh, you want to resign? That's great. This makes matters so much easier. Goodbye. Now, Cyril and Memnon were both to remain under house arrest, but Cyril had slipped out of the city and was already on his way back to Alexandria. When Theodosius realized this, when it was reported to him, he changed the imperial order. And he said, well, I meant that he was uh, not supposed to leave Alexandria once he got there. He's in house arrest, miles away. When Cyril returned, he was greeted, um, shall we say, somewhat unceremoniously. You see, his people had gotten word of what he did. Bribing, appending 12 anathemas, and apparently he was a bit of a hothead. I think I mentioned that in part four. And they were somewhat unimpressed. Happy that orthodoxy prevailed, not pleased with the means. It was messy. Let's be honest. It was messy. Now, it, I, I need to say, before we move too far, Celestine himself did not confirm this council, and neither did his successor, Sixtus III. They didn't feel the need to. The legates had already done that, signifying the Pope's approval. When the legates acted, it was as if Celestine was acting. So we can rightly understand Ephesus to be not only ecumenical, East and West, but authoritative. I should note that it was not formally confirmed by a pontiff until Chalcedon 451, at which time Leo the Great was the Pope. But there's this lingering problem between Cyril and John of Antioch. Remember, John is not a heretic. He disagrees with Cyril, but he isn't quite aligned with Nestorius. He's not a Nestorian who's just holding out. He has some real issues with the way Cyril is understanding Christology and presenting it as if it were the only way. In the aftermath, like I mentioned, it was messy. And the aftermath is also quite messy. The focus is on Cyril's 12 anathemas. The majority of bishops had accepted that Mary was the Theotokos, and they had rejected Nestorianism. So what started this was over. Now they're, they're turning their attention to Cyril 
in his writings, and they're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Since when do we have to accept this also? Remember, the 12 anathemas were not read at the council, at least not uh, in the sources that I've been reviewing. So how to solve this? There was an old man. He's described by Father Leo Davis as the dean of the Eastern Patriarchate. And I don't think that that is to be understood as an official position uh, as much as it is to be understood as sort of an... um, He's the elder, shall we say. He's the de facto leader. He's the veteran. He's the guy, right? The Don, if you will. And his name is Acacius of Barawea. Acacius is very level-headed, he's very balanced, dignified, and diplomatic. And he goes to Cyril, or he writes to Cyril, rather, and he writes to John of Antioch, and he convinces the two to compromise with one another. Their influence, Acacius can see, will be more far-reaching among their devotees if they compromise. John eventually accepts Ephesus's condemnation of Nestorius, although in his letter to Cyril and to Acacius, he doesn't mention the twelve anathemas. You see, Cyril and John, after the council, their tempers cooled. They were willing to be more flexible with each other afterwards than they were before and during. Remember, in all likelihood, John was stalling. He says, I'll be there in five or six days. And several days, 16 days, as a matter of fact, 16 days later, he's not there. When he does show up, four days after that, 20 days total, he convokes a whole second council and condemns and deposes uh, uh, Cyril. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty. And I believe that John of Antioch and Cyril of Alexandria could recognize that, you know, we are not very far apart. This, uh, this John, thinks Cyril to himself, is not Nestorius. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they signed what uh, has become known as the Formula of Union, or the Act of Union. And I'd like to read, it's not very long, I've got it here in front of me, if you'll permit me. We confess, therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, perfect God and perfect man, consisting of a rational soul and a body begotten of the Father before the ages as touching the Godhood, the same in the last days for us and our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary as touching his manhood, the same of one substance with the Father as touching his Godhead, and of one substance with us as touching his manhood. For of two natures a union has been made. For this cause we confess one Christ, one Son, one Lord. In accordance with this, of the unconfused union, we confess the Holy Virgin to be Theotokos, because God the Word became incarnate and was made man, and from the very conception united to himself the temple taken from her. And as to the expressions concerning the Lord in the Gospels and Epistles, we are aware that theologians understand some as common, as relating to one person, and others they distinguish as relating to two natures, explaining those that befit the divine nature according to the Godhood, Godhead of Christ, and those of a humble sort according to his manhood. End of section. So in that brief act of union, John is saying, you know, I think Cyril is right. Now, The act of union was scandalous to some. You could understand. 
compromise is not always viewed very favorably by those on the extremes. Think of the extremes in the church today. And think of those more in the middle, if you will, who are willing to compromise with one another. Okay, Certain names of certain bishops come to mind. I'll refrain from uttering them here. I think you see the point. If you're too far away from a proper balance, compromise seems like selling out. Back then, same way. Another Acacius, Acacius of Miletine, thought Cyril gave in way too much. He was allowing John to speak of two natures. He's allowing him to speak of some things can be said of the manhood, some things can be said of the Godhead. Hmm. Sounds Nestorian. Theodoret of Cyrus thought John should have refused until Cyril withdrew the twelve anathemas, which again he appended without Celestine's permission. Some Eastern bishops wrote to Sixtus III, Celestine's successor, for aid, but I don't believe it ever came. Only after considerable imperial pressure did Theodoret of Cyrus eventually agree to the Union and, and sign it. Why is he important? He was a big-name theologian back then, very bright, but he had Nestorian-ish tendencies. Theodoret of Cyrus refused to condemn Nestorius, although he did sign the formula of union, and with his signature, this signaled the end to much, if in fact most, of the resistance to Cyril. Nestorius himself, from his home in Antioch, where he had uh, resigned, he was sent into exile. He never recanted, and he wrote a book under a pseudonym, Heraclides, defending himself. Obviously, it was in the third person. He was speaking of this Nestorius who had been treated wrongly by this Cyril. He died in 452, a year after the next council, Chalcedon. And as far as I know, as far as my sources have indicated, he believed he was right. So, in other words, it seems that he died unrepentant. He died firmly a heretic. I'm checking the time. Okay, a little more, a little more. <clears throat> There's some salt in the wound. In the years following Ephesus, 431, Maximian, the new patriarch of Constantinople, died, and he was replaced by a man named Proclus, or Proclus. Proclus set about writing against Nestorianism. Fair enough. But he also included condemnations of the writings of Theodore of Mopsuestia, who was Nestorius's mentor and who, up until about that time, was a well-respected theologian. The problem with this is that Theodore had died in communion with the church in 428. Naturally, this move agitated those who were previously sympathetic to Nestorius, like John of Antioch. And they wrote to Cyril. Cyril, thanks be to God, he's calmed down in his upper years. Cyril convinced Proclus to cease, and cease he did. And so the conflict died down for a while. In the 430s and the, the 440s, a quick succession of deaths changed the scene, if you will. Pope Celestine died in 432, just a year after Ephesus, replaced by Sixtus III, who was next to die in the year 440. John of Antioch in 442, Cyril in 444, and Proclus in 446. With all of these major players from Ephesus out of the way, these are the guys who drew up and signed 
and then enforced the formula of union. These are the compromisers. These are the ones who want unity. With these guys out of the picture, we obviously have the making of another crisis. All right, enough of that. As a side note, I want to mention that Nestorian Christians exist to this day. They left the church, they broke away. They're known today as the Church of the East or the Assyrian Church of the East, and they number somewhere around half a million worldwide. So, kind of interesting. All right, I want to thank everyone who's watching this for watching this. Don't forget to patronize this channel. Subscribe, like, share, etc. Do all the things. Make sure to hit Timothy Flanders' Patreon, Jeremiah Bannister's Patreon. Download Telegram, get yourself in the Wolfpack chat, be a glad trad. Don't be a mad trad, or rad, bad, sad, fad, whatever. Be a glad trad. It's better, it's more fun. We strike a balance, we laugh, we have a good time, we learn some history. It's good. All right, once more, thanks for your attention. And as always, Never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori.